Okay. Hi, Nia. Hi. So I guess today we're going to be talking about something that's really cool, something that's not very uh, common, and that's about silent retreats. And you're the best person for that because you've done it not just once or twice, but like four or five times. So before we go into that, let me just share with people a little bit about you. Well, you and I met a few years ago back in Cabo. That's where you're still at. You're in Cabo. Um, and they're going to notice that you have an accent, and that's because you're Russian. And so, but you lived in the States, in California, um, and that's where you picked up your English so well, I'm guessing, right? Definitely. I actually lived in Dubai for six years, so I finished the high school there. So that's how I learned English. In Dubai is where you learned English? <laughs> yeah. Nice. Okay. Okay. And then... Um, well, you live in Cabo, you get to talk a lot, of, a lot of English there. So, and so we're gonna dive into, um, into silent retreats, but before I do, uh, guys, Nia is very spiritual oriented. Um, she's studying psychology, which is, which helps a lot. And because she's very interested in understanding humans and how they think and how they behave. But on top of that, she's always trying to lead a very healthy lifestyle by, by eating in a certain way. I think you're vegetarian, correct? I, know, like, I do my best, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, and then you do a lot of yoga and I think you're certified in yoga. And then now you're, you're, you're delving into silent retreats. So let's go ahead and start with that. Um, how, when did it start and what got you interested in doing that to begin with? Mm, so my first silent retreat really occurred quite spontaneously. I just kind of woke up and it was like, I really want to be in silence for mm. some days. And um, I just, googled silent retreats or like meditation retreats and I found a school located in Masunte and um, it was a very beautiful experience that uh, really just in that moment after having those days in silence for me was like wow this is something I want to commit to doing for the next years because it just caused such a shift in me that I was like <laughs> so. so let's hold on to that first one because the first experience is probably the most impactful how long was it so it's actually funny because it was the shortest one because it was um they had to cancel the first day due to some issues the school had and it ended up being just two days but I think I had such a like strong yearning and such strong concentration and it was already like so devotional that it just ended up being really powerful for me. But I think each retreat also for me is really different for each person depending on their conditions, of the mind, of the life situation. So you're just going to have like a slightly different experience each time. Mm -hmm. that makes sense had times when it was just like extremely easy to focus extremely easy to drop into awareness within two days and I've had experience where my mind was so resistant that like the 10 days felt like um more challenging mm -hmm. that makes sense the longer probably it, it's like it's like trying to focus on something even though you're not doing much and you're keeping quiet you still have to focus on what's happening in here and maybe sometimes we'll resist that i don't know that's my guess so what was the most impactful thing after you like you said that the first time was very impactful that makes sense what was it is there one thing in particular that made it super impactful or are there two things or three things mm -hmm. Well, I can't really explain it, <laughs> but it was probably like my first 
time to really connecting to myself in ways that were beyond just talk and really connecting to an awareness and really connecting to the feelings within. And I just remember kind, I mean, this is like going a little in different direction, but uh, I just remember kind of like breaking out crying and thinking I'll never want to leave this place again <laughs> because whatever I found there was more real than anything I've experienced in my life. Really? Yeah, but it's it was like a feeling and you could say that that was like, I mean, I was already into yoga. I was already into all these things, um, but I, I, <laughs> I don't know how to explain it but yeah it was just I really connected to it and I was very inspired by the openness of the teacher by the devotion um, by that opening within myself because I didn't really know how to find it outside so in that moment I was like wow what, what is my purpose like what am I even doing elsewhere and then later, as I started to like come back, as I started to really take a look at my own life, as I started to shift things, now when I go back, it's a beautiful feeling and I can drop deeper and stay in silence and connect. But I don't have that desperation anymore of like, oh, this is the only place. It's like I can cultivate it in daily life a little bit more too now. Yeah, I was going to ask you, is it possible for people to do their own silent, silent retreat, like in their home, like even if they live with kids, with kids for me, for me, for instance, if I try to do it, can I do it? Or is it really not the same effect? Um, it's like you can definitely do it, but the intention needs to be there a little bit of what you're doing it for. So having a guided meditation retreat really helps you to like, in that specific one, for example, they give you different practices from Buddhism, from Christianity, Sufism, all the different traditions, practices to kind of drop into that state of being aware. So... Oh okay that's the goal right it's not just about like oh well i'm just silently looking at the ceiling for five hours you're really trying to step into witnessing you're trying to connect within to your awareness which in reality is you could say like um psychologist work for me is the same like i just have been realizing that in a funny way it's like how they say like all roads lead to Rome. <laughs> and I think it's the same way, like psychology is based on uncovering those projections and those uh, like unconscious reactions and everything so that we can step into being aware. The same goal is with spirituality, the same goal is with religion. It's just a little different things and all of them probably have a little um going off <laughs> okay I don't know if that makes sense but yeah. yeah like so all I'm saying is I guess like can you cook pasta from scratch yeah definitely by yourself you can but would it be helpful to first experience it in a guided say setting that could maybe like cultivate a little more devotion like could you meditate for three hours without moving and stay on setting most people are not really able to do it but if you're in a room with 50 people there is also um that like uh, like the social it, pressure it's not a social pressure it's more like it's there is um i don't know like we affect each, each other in one way or another, right? So if you have someone, like actually for just as an example, they describe that a lot in silent retreats is for example, there will be a room of 50 people and you will notice like when they watch the cameras, if one person starts to fall asleep within minutes, like a couple of people next to just like dominoes start to feel sleepy. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So okay. yes. So 
the collective mind power has a power, right? So if you're in a room with 50 people who are super devoted to finding themselves, to being aware, to focusing on that, you just have a little higher chance to like um, actually get into it for the first time, you could say. And then again, it's like, yeah, you can definitely do it in your house. But the idea is like, you're probably going to see like, oh, this is the guitar and it's going to remind you to, of your boyfriend and oh, these are my clothes. And there is just like a lot of things attached where when you go to like a school that you don't know the place where you're covering the mirror, where you're not interacting with a lot of people, you have a little more chance to for, for your mind to be less distracted and to stay present with what is rather than like the stories yeah that's a good point like if you go in your and you don't have these dis these distractions the things that will pop in your head will be more organic versus here it's like we have all these people and items that mm -hmm. maybe they wouldn't pop in our heads if we were to be in a separate location completely away from it and the things that appear in the head are the things that are reoccurring or things that need to get, get addressed and if yeah. we're here, we can't address them because we're constantly um, distracted, like you said. Okay, so that, that, that. So yeah. the entire journey is about like, um, because we identify a lot as like a certain person, we, we act a lot from the mind, right? And so the spirituality or silent retreat is about like, well, who am I beyond those things, right? Who is aware of all those things? And so it just gives like a little bit more opportunity to dive into that with support of like teachers, guidance, schedule, the food they give is very um, like without spices and a lot of things. So just, you can definitely do it in your regular life and there are also like completely different pathways to the same thing like you can do a lot of shadow work inner work i believe it takes you to the same place like in psychology um what do you mean of, by shadow work um so well, like inner so there are parts of us which are conscious and which are light oh right? okay right which we are conscious of and then there are sharp parts of us that cause projections that cause um a lot of things that we don't want to see in ourselves so if we start to bring those up we remove the so you're talking about the shadow like like the like sigmund freud shadows like or like yeah. Carl Jung or so I believe those works the same, take you to the same direction because what you're doing is you're removing all those ideas from your head and projections and whatever is causing you to identify and not act from a place of awareness and it brings you back to that. Okay. So that's one way, right? Then there is another way where you could be like a karma yogi, which is like, um, how can we act from uh service like i'm gonna give up all my actions i'm gonna serve right like fr from love for love kind of giving up the expectations doesn't mean we don't plan it doesn't mean we have a goal but you're like okay i'm doing it focusing on the moment i'm doing it as an offering so that's like more like being a householder so it's definitely not about like everyone having to become um a monk it's not about like everyone having to give up everything external because in reality um even the entire surrender the entire path of a monk is really surrendering in the head and giving up all those attachments from your mind rather than like you could still enjoy chocolate and there is nothing wrong with it the problem is when you like can't live without enjoying chocolate right 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 so it's all and there are, it's like for example like actually it's actually even interesting because sometimes i remember in the silent retreat someone asked they were like okay well 
how do I know if like this path is for me to like just give everything up and like dedicate my life to that and the teacher he answered well if you're asking from your mind it's not for you <laughs> because when it's for you it's gonna come completely naturally so if you're doing it as like oh should I I should do this to like maybe escape responsibility or that's not for you because okay. when people go that way to do like fully dedicate it often should come from like wow like this is what I want to do because all the other things are simply not interesting. Right. Okay. So from a, from a asking that question in a genuine way versus seeking the logic behind it. Yeah. Like it's not going to make logical sense. You can find the faults in the path, for instance, but if you truly, I'm, there's a path for everybody and we kind of since, okay, since we're all one, the path is going to be the same one for all. Does that make any sense? Perhaps differently. Huh? It's going to be the same path, but each of us are going to approach it differently. Right. Okay. So there and is not like one right thing for all, but in the end, we are all going the same direction. <laughs> yeah, we're all going to go to the same place anyway. Yeah. So yeah. So, okay. Um, and then a silent retreat is one way to do it. So the other one would be through yeah. a section. And the thing about the silent retreat is like, they will even tell it to you. It's like, the goal is not to like, really be in a silent retreat. It's like, okay, like we drop into these states of awareness. We learn all these things. Now, how can I actually go and integrate it in my daily life? Um, and leave it actually yes okay so let's go into you come out of the silent retreat for the first time what was it like to go into reality into the busyness and noisy life Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> nice okay so tell us more tell us more why was it terrible um well like i said for the first time i like didn't even want to go back <laughs> but I was just like really overwhelmed by all this stimulation in the beginning. And it was like, you could say it was like really an awakening in, of some sort because I was like, wow, there is like just so many things that are not going from a place of love in my life. And everything was done like, um, through the mind and the children and the arguments and so much things and coming back to that was really hard um just because it's like i don't know like some a lot of that's another thing right like a lot of people they say like they put spirituality as this like beautiful experience thing that everything is beautiful but it is when you do the work but to do the work is to see at a lot of truth that might not be necessarily pleasant, right? So it's like- Give me an example. Okay. Um, okay, if I, I like to use, for example, the uh, example of like becoming vegan, right? Mm. Okay, so being vegan will open you up to connecting to an animal beyond just like oh this is something I could eat right you are able to see an animal you're able to love it you're able to open yourself up to the pain to the suffering how kind like kind of how you could connect to a dog right because okay. wow a dog is like amazing you're like a dog everyone loves dogs right mm -hmm. all the other animals we keep a certain disconnection right because in order to eat it, you cannot eat a dog, can you? You cannot. Oh, okay. I see what right? you mean. So okay. becoming vegan and like recognizing that you're like opening up your heart, you're opening up your compassion. You're like, wow, I can treat this animal as, an as a being and I can fully love it because I'm not going to hurt it. And because I don't need to create all those things. But before that happens, before you're in this blissful state, 
you come back and you have to take a look at the ways you have been hurting the animals for the last five, six years, at the suffering that is being caused by humanity. You have to see how in order for you to, or you have to like have the recognition of like how in order for you to have that glass of milk, a baby calf has to have to cry for a month. So it's like, before you got to that openness and love, you had to recognize all the other ways in which you were hurting, right? Yeah. So in the same way, it's like, in order to uh, not transcend, but transmute a certain shadow into light, you have to recognize the shadow first. You but like to... super, you have to really recognize how bad something is for it to be impactful enough for you to make such a light. hundred percent. That, that's terrible. Totally yeah and that's really hard so it's like coming back from a retreat and recognizing where i'm like wow like i don't know i am so aggressive in certain ways i am hurting myself by eating these foods i'm not being a loving mother or loving partner right like there has to come recognition of what doesn't work in order for it to align and that's a really hard thing to recognize a lot of times for people because that's why we just kind of go bypassing a bunch of stuff. So yeah, we don't want to let go of certain things. We don't want to believe it because the ego wants to say, no, I'm a good person. I'm a good this. I'm a good that. I do everything good. Right. <laughs> and so, yeah, so like sure. in order to it's like even just with the animals, it's like we don't even like, for example, I'm not even like fully vegan yet because I don't have the willpower, but it's like people don't will not even accept the fact that like animals are suffering because the ego wants to go there. You don't want to because in order to accept that, you have to allow yourself to feel that. And no one wants that. That is something I, I have a lot of questions about, about becoming vegan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's going to have to wait because that's, that's, that's another one. I have questions about that one. Um, so, okay, hold on. Before, before we, I don't know how long this has been, but anyway, um, tell me more about what it was like like how, how, after you came out of your retreat, your first one, why was it so overwhelming? Was it hard for you to fall asleep? Like, were you super, did you notice your senses become heightened because you are more sensitive to stuff? Like you have two kids and they, and kids are loud. I mean, I don't know. My kids are loud. So how was that? I would, I it's going to be very, I, I don't know if I should go like too much into my personal experience because it's going to be so different on each person, where they are, how they experience. And sometimes like having certain expectations can also like put us back. Mm. So I don't want to go like too much into it. But I've had times where I came back from the silent retreat and I literally had to stay with uh, earplugs because it was just like a little bit overwhelming, but I've also had times when I came back and I was like, wow, nothing bothers me. <laughs> like, I mean, nothing is triggering me because I stepped into the awareness in a very stabilized way. So it's like, I could feel my frustration, but it didn't go past the point where I was expressing it. So like, I would feel like an energy movement or kind of like sensations within my body, which I knew was expression of like, oh, I'm getting angry because my um, hand is like feeling like a pulsation, but I didn't feel the need to go further because I was already aware of it and I could stop there and I could be like, well, everything is okay, so. I, so. I actually know exactly what you're referring to. You feel it, but there's like a buffer there's like something there preventing it from getting out of control. That happened to me when I was doing the cold exposure. Um, so I know exactly 
Yeah, so what, what that is referring to is exactly that. It's with that emotion. So, what? Repeat that one more time because you got cut off. Okay. Um, I was saying that in that moment, I'm not being identified with the energy or the emotion. I'm the awareness. I'm in a state of witnessing it. So that way, that's what I was also talking to you the other day is it gives you a certain freedom because you're not acting from those energies. You have a choice. Well, I'm feeling anger. Do I want to express it? Or do I want to keep it? Or do I want to go take a moment to sit alone? Right? Where usually okay. we are like, I'm angry. And then you're like screaming, you're getting mad at your kids, whatever it might be, right? Okay. So the entire journey is to really like, how can we shift into the awareness more and more? And um, do you know any like, psychological benefits to doing these sort of things has it been recorded so i read a study i can also like definitely share it with whoever wants um there have been actually done a lot of studies on like vipassana and meditation retreats and um it definitely like increases uh happiness contentment levels and decreases stress and also increases like your ability to um deal with stressful situations for like a period of six months after even if the practitioner is not increasing the daily meditation practice which is pretty cool oh that's nice yeah okay <laughs> and do you think it'll ever come a point for you to where you're going to be like you know I don't need these anymore. I think I'm good. I, I don't, I don't need these, um, sessions. Um, I mean, it's definitely getting closer every year, like where I, I, like I said, like, I don't have that, like anymore, that feeling where it's like, oh my God, if I don't go to the silent retreat, like, I don't know what's going to happen, <laughs> right? Like I feel pretty much more stable in my life. Um, I feel like I can have those similar experience within my practice, within my home, um, actually like even been shifting more into like not even being about like silence, but um, it's just a very beautiful thing, but definitely like everyone has their own thing I don't know if it's like for everyone I can't say that you need to do it every year but um at least once in a lifetime for sure yeah for sure at least once in a lifetime um okay I don't think I have any other questions mm -hmm. um but if do you feel like adding anything else one last bit of information I just feel like we are like so overstimulated all the time and if you like you say like if you just start to do like every now and then spend half a day not um talking, turn off technology um, in silence too. You can even continue to do like whatever you do, but in silence and really shift to trying to do it with a sense of like presence of like, okay, how does this feel right now? Can I focus fully on the moment and not worry about how it's going to turn out and not worry if I'm doing it good enough, but you can do that with your daily activities. I think even that can like lead to something. So okay. if someone doesn't have the opportunity to go to the silent retreat, definitely I would recommend to just give a chance to um, connect a little bit to actually embodying the body and being present with what you're doing. That's helpful because yeah, I, I don't know why I didn't ask that. 
Of course. Yeah. Like, what can we do for those that we can't just like pick up and go to a silent retreat? So what you're saying is take about 30 minutes, zero distractions, silence, and really yeah. connect to what's Half a day. Here. Half a day. <laughs> what? Half a day. At least. Half a day? Yeah. And you can still keep going doing your things. Like, I mean, I don't know, whatever that might be. Just don't watch TV. Don't do like... You can paint, you can create, you can oh yeah, be in yeah. nature, go on a hike, whatever that is, right? Like connect to being present, connect to mindfulness, and like move a little bit into that meditation. And wherever you're, whatever you're doing, when you notice about like oh, there is a lot of thoughts, I'm not able to to focus. Be like okay, like it's kind of like this game of like okay, well. Who is not able to focus because someone is aware of that? Right? I love that. Yeah. So right. You just keep going, bringing your practice back to like, well, who am I? Because there is that thought, there is that feeling in me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Okay. So it's like, if you can commit to doing that, like for, I don't know, every two weeks spend half a day either in nature either at home you can keep cleaning you can do whatever you're doing but make the intention to be fully present without letting go of expectations and really connecting to that awareness in which everything else is happening that would be really helpful and of course like a meditation practice is beautiful in that too mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and if anyone have questions i'll be happy to yeah of course if anybody wants to know more about silent retreats or where where nia goes to do hers in mexico just send her a message and yeah so ultimately we have to find ways in our own life to become more and more like a silent observer to yeah. address things because we all have things we all have problems and we're how are we going to solve the problems if we're constantly adding more problems because we're constantly distracted and so it's like shoving things under the rug we have to like stop and and start like addressing them instead of just letting them pile up and then we and then we wonder why are we so stressed and why are we why do we have anxiety and why do we deal with depression and why are we so overwhelmed well it's because we never get to address them but yeah. But I loved what you said because it's like really just points to the <laughs> core of the whole truth is like the silent observer. Like, how can I be the witness and how can I connect to the witness? Because most of us don't even realize that we are bit witnessing. We're just like, oh, yeah, like I'm angry right now, I'm sad, blah, blah, blah. But who is the I? And someone is watching all those thoughts. So it's like, can I step into that awareness and can I learn to rest there? Because in that awareness, everything else can be happening, but you're in peace, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not even about outside silence. It's finding that stillness within. Right. But it's probably easier to do it in a silent retreat in the beginning. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Nia. I, I know you're busy and, and but this this yeah. this is a very cool topic because it's not like I said, it's not something that people just do. You're the only person I know that has done a silent <laughs> retreat. And so I needed to know like what what do you get out of it? Like I know a little bit about silent retreats. I, I watched the movie Eat Pray Love, and that's the only reason why I know. Mm -hmm. But but yeah, everything you shared was very helpful. So thank you. Thank you for listening and for opening this up. It was very yeah, fun. Of course. Thank you. We'll hopefully do more. <laughs>